let's uh, talk about banks Nirav Shet head of institutional equities uh, at SPI Capital Securities joins us on the show. Uh, Nirav, thanks a lot for joining us. Uh, you know, banks are really the flavor of the day, second day in, uh, in, in a row. Uh, but, you know, the stocks have moved up by 20% to 50%, roughly, you know, if you look at PNB. Uh, is there still an opportunity or uh, this is too much now, one should wait? So, you can't get anchored by what has happened, right? In a sense that if you look at what has happened in the last two days, the stocks are up by 50%. Mm. And if I look at the last five years, the stocks have not touched the 2012 levels, mm. right? So, I'm not too worried about that. It's a big thing, right? If an FN comes and tells you that, you know, I'm taking the bankruptcy risks away from this set of companies. Secondly, I think it's a big move for the economy uptake, right? I have never seen any economy in the world which can pick up without credit growth picking up. Mm. Right, and mm. which was my basic concern that how could you not have monetary stimulus when my credit growth is at decadal lows? This unclocks that credit cycle, and when you unclock the credit cycle, it unclocks the growth rate. Mm. So, I think that this is a big move, I think, for the economy. And obviously, PSU banks, uh, you know, one sided trade, right? You had Bajaj Finance, which was mm. worth like almost as, as much an Axis bank. So, I think that bipolarity in the market, I think that will sort of unravel itself. At least that's the view that I'm carrying. But they say there is no, not much credit demand actually. That's why banks have not been lending, not because they were short of capital. You uh, don't seem to be agree to that. I don't believe in that at all. I, I, I think the fact of the matter is that one of the biggest places in the Indian market for the next five, ten years is the fact that the demand for credit is far more than supply for credit. I mean, think about it. All you have done so far, like if I just talk about the retail market, all you have done so far is that you figured out how to lend to guys like us who got salaries, right? And we are talking about 50 million guys, right? There are, there are another 300 million guys who don't have access to income tax records. And which is why you've seen all these lab products and, you know, people getting into seven broad categories and microfinance companies, you name it. I mean, you got demand for the products right from, uh, you know, 10% IRR to 30% IRR, right? How, how can that exist in a market uh, if you believe that, uh, you know, you're constant for uh, demand for credit? I don't believe in that. Okay. The the tricky question, Nirav, good morning and thanks for joining in. Pleasure again. Is, is what happens to the private sector's banking space, uh, particularly because there the banks are split largely uh, between corporate facing and having some stress versus the predominantly retail facing banks and not having stress at all and expensive valuations. Does that trade uh, change a bit as well or do you think the market will continue to prefer that uh, for the lack of a better word quality? So, I uh, broadly, I think that uh, the way I look at it is that extreme level of valuations are very apparent in the market, right? Mm. If something is trading at 8 times book, 10 times book, uh, it's very apparent that, you know, these are crazy valuations. Mm. Likewise, something is trading at below book and 0.5 times book, you can make a case that, you know, extremely undervalued. You don't know the triggers which will unlock uh, the stories in both the sides of the trade. Sure. A lot of the banks that you talked about are somewhere in between, right? So, I think you need to approach on a bank by bank basis in terms of what are the growth rates. As just for the sake of argument, I don't think that you know you you're going to get worried about what's going to happen to this broad sector of uh, mid-cap private sector banks. I'm not worried about that. But if something is trading at six times book, five times book, seven times book, I think because the growth differential will narrow, right? Yes. What has happened? What, what are the markets telling you? If PNB is of 50 percent, if State Bank of India is 30 percent, it tells you that you are forecasting higher growth. Right? That means that the growth differential between PSU and the private sector may will come down. So, one time reset in valuations can happen for sure. Yeah, and, yeah I, I think this is also probably happening because until now, uh, investors didn't have a choice. They couldn't go out and invest into PSU banks. Now, at least there is a choice and therefore that mean reversal could happen. There's so much of banking that we've spoken about, Nirav, today. Right. I want to move on to some of the other pockets as well. Uh, one, one thought that you've shared, Ustazan, which is what I want to quiz you about. You don't like cement. Now, why would that be the case? One. Uh, the numbers reporting was good. The commentary wasn't bad from any of the players. If at all, they were cautious on costs, but not so much on demand. And if indeed Bharat Mala and some of the other things happen, if indeed housing happens, which seems to be the case, why would cement not be a space that you would like? Perfect. So, it is a very relevant question. For, for example, the work that you've done, it's amply clear that the leverage of cement to GDP is in the region of 1.3, 1.4 times. Mm. Cement demand cannot surprise you on the upside. It has not happened in China. When China was growing at 12%, cement demand was growing at about 15%, right? So, I don't have, I've got a very high comfort in terms of trying to assess that it is not that cement can go at 15% tomorrow. That is out of the way. Cement cycles are caused by shocks in supply, right? 
that is not happening right now. So a broad, a broad hypothesis is right now that your utilization levels are at about 68, 69 levels. Till that time you don't hit those 83, 84 levels, those boom in profit doesn't happen, right? So it's a timing call more than anything else. I, we think you are at least about six quarters away uh, from those things to fall into the place. Okay. And then the valuations like consumer valuations, which is not where the commodity should be trading at, frankly. Would you like to play this entire Bharat Mala project? Is there a way which stocks uh, could one probably pick up? So I think the way to play these two EPC companies, right? So I think you look at those companies which have got decent amount of operating cash flows, decent level of ROEs. You don't want to bet too much on turnaround companies. It's not a sector that is known for creating shareholder value. But I think there are pockets of uh, excellence over there. And I suspect that, again, it is a sector where ROEs can go up simply because the demand for the work is significantly going to be higher than the capacity which is there right now in that space. So broadly, 30,000 feet view, I like the sector, which is the EPC companies, those companies in the BOT space, hybrid annuity, stuff like that. And you know what I find interesting, you know, now what you have also mentioned that uh, the, uh, the, cap uh, the capital uh, investment will probably start with a lag. Why is it so? I mean, you just mentioned that this uh, you know, the PSU capitalization should be seen as a big booster to the economy. But still, you don't expect the, uh, the capital investment to really start. So, I think we do, uh, what you are talking about essentially is the sequencing of how demand is going to pick up, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, let's look at one of the biggest uh, capital goods sector is power utilities. You got plant load factor in the region about 62%, right? And if you got it 62%, then I don't think that any investment cycle can pick up, irrespective of how low interest rates are going to be, right? It's only when I see a prospective ROE in the investments, I'm going to have that cycle picking up. Hmm. And there are other concerns around renewables and stuff like that on what is happening on the PLF. Uh, uh, it's obviously depressing the PLF of the utility sectors. So I think you need to give time to the fact that that negative output gap in some of these sectors will take time to shrink. So maybe what you're saying is that that cycle is probably 18 months away. But I think, for example, what are we excited about? We are excited about the fact that where there is a big uh, positive output game, in a sense that no infrastructure, no roads, build more ports, uh, stuff like that. That is where I think the next level of investment cycle is going to come. So you have to differentiate between the private corporate capex and the government induced capex, which is infrastructure capex. The second leg I think is going to come first. That eventually means that you will consume more steel, more aluminum, uh, and then that eventually translates into a higher secondary demand for the utilities, eventually. So it's a question of sequencing in terms of where the demand is going to come first. Mm. Okay. I'm looking at what you're positive on, Nirav. Uh, mm. Spoken about BFSIS, uh, and argue about four-wheelers. Aviation, that's an interesting pocket. Uh, it's not that the stocks are really trading at uh, the nadirs that they used to some years back. Uh, is this the recent growth data numbers that is fueling this optimism? There are two things to it. Obviously, uh, that uh, the growth is also dependent upon the fact that you've got a very benign view of the oil prices. I'm not really worried about those episodic increases in oil going to $65, $70. We can't preempt that, right? But if you take a fundamental view in terms of how the shale oil is uh, replacing uh, the marginal cost of production and the swing producer for the global economy uh, at large, uh, then I think you've never seen a case in history where oil doesn't do anything for the next five or eight or ten years and then suddenly you've got 20% growth rate in uh, the aviation sector. Uh, now think of it that on an installed base of about 450 odd planes, a 15 or 80 percent growth talks about that you need to add about 80 or 90 planes every year. Who is prepared for that? Right? So we are talking about different levels of threshold in terms of the PLF for the aircraft, uh, different levels of uh, the profits. Uh, all of us are anchored by what has happened, right? A classic case is what Warren Buffett said that you know, you could have never made money investing in airlines and he's put in $10 billion of his own money. The fact of the matter is that if you only look at the balance sheet of any of the large cap companies, Indigo, SpiceJet, uh, free cash flow yield is about 9%, 8%, right? So if you just remove the name of uh, the airline company and if you look at uh, the p and the cash flows, uh, they are as good as any other FMCG company. You don't, you'll be surprised, but you don't need any capital to start an airline. You can virtually run uh, well, uh, with very, very minimal right. levels of capital because that's a lease model. So you like the entire space or you like... I like the entire space, but obviously uh, we like SpiceJet more because the valuation gap is significant as compared to Indigo and it's going on the same path that Indigo is in terms of the deal with the Boeing and therefore the sale and leaseback profit which kicks in uh, next year. Uh, valuation, I think, roughly one half that of Indigo uh, with similar levels of profit. So fairly bullish on that space. Mm -hmm.
You know, just like PSU banks, after a long time, so many years, uh, people are expecting to see kind of re-rating in telecom as well. What's your view on that? If it's not happened already. <laughs> uh, we are not very bullish on telecom. Mm. Uh, I'm Frankly, I'm slightly confused in terms of what Reliance is doing, right? Uh, you have to keep in, uh, you need to be mindful of the fact that market is rewarding uh, disruptive guys in a, a different fashion, right? Uh, if you got a model like an uh, Uber or a Netflix, uh, you are allowed to blow billions of dollars every year, uh, assuming that at some point of time my eventual free cash flows will pay back for what I'm burning right now, right? Uh, you got a similar kind of vision coming from Reliance in the telecom space, right? And therefore, I I believe that. There is a case that Reliance is going to be a big disruptor. You cannot value the telecom business in a similar fashion when you look at uh, the other telecom companies. Why we don't like the space is simply because of the fact that you cannot have one guy controlling 60% of capital employed and 10% of market share. That has to align. I don't think Reliance is going to come and say that I've got a 12% market share. Now let us try and take the industry profits up. That's not going to happen. I'm almost willing to take a bet on that. Mm. I think we are far away from that equilibrium situation. Uh, that's that's well put uh, and okay fine I, I agree with that argument as as well one last question really at least from my end uh, all marketing companies uh, that's an interesting pocket uh, they've moved up quite a bit uh, is this view again based on the fact that you don't think that crude oil will have substantially high levels and therefore uh, these companies will continue to do well Indeed. So I think that you uh, obviously if oil goes to $100, a lot of the bets are off, right? Be it for aviation, be it for oil marketing companies, because in any government you cannot have a similar kind of uh, price reset happening because there are secondary effects uh, uh, to the economy as well. Uh, outside that, I think combination of both. The fact that you've got a benign view of oil prices. Secondly, also the fact that if you look at the economics of only the marketing business of oil companies, uh, very, very highly ROE attractive. It's just that, you know, they seem to get lost because you get one broad uh, figures, uh, which is console numbers for refining, for piping, and for OMC companies. I would argue that, for example, if you make a case that you can spin out the oil marketing companies, they could be worth twice as much they are trading right now. Because same thing, you know, you got a decent view on a growth in free cash flows for a long period of time. And let's be very clear, the competitive advantage that these companies own today as compared sure. to private refiners in the last cycle is fairly different because they have a lot of flexibility in terms of their pricing. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. true. Okay. And Nirav, we'll leave it at that. But thanks so much for taking the time out and joining us today. I look forward to having more often on this forum. Thank you so much. A pleasure being here. Yeah, thank you.